Well, good evening, everyone, and welcome to tonight's webinar, uh, the fifth in our five webinar series on building a better disciple. Uh, tonight, vocation and mission, the aim of discipleship. Of course, before we get started, we'd like to begin our webinar tonight with a short prayer. Uh, tonight, uh, we'll again have a short opening prayer, a... Um, somewhat lengthy uh, gospel reading, uh, and then the Our Father at the end. So I invite you to get yourself comfortable uh, for the webinar tonight. Uh, get yourself into a, a posture where it will be easy for you to pray, and we will begin together in prayer. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Let us pray. O God, who in the power of the Holy Spirit have sent your word to announce good news to the poor, grant that with eyes fixed upon him we may ever live in sincere charity, made heralds and witnesses of his gospel in all the world. Through our Lord Jesus Christ, your Son, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God for ever and ever. Amen. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to Matthew. Jesus said to his disciples, When the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, he will sit upon his glorious throne, and all the nations will be assembled before him. And he will separate them one from another, as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. He will place the sheep on his right and the goats on his left. Then the king will say to those on his right, Come, you who are blessed by my Father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me food. I was thirsty, and you gave me drink. A stranger, and you welcomed me. Naked, and you clothed me. Ill, and you cared for me. In prison, and you visited me. Then the righteous will answer him and say, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you, or thirsty and give you drink? When did we see you a stranger and welcome you, or naked and clothe you? When did we see you ill or in prison and visit you? And the king will say to them in reply, Amen, I say to you, whatever you did for one of the least brothers of mine, you did for me. Then he will say to those on his left, Depart from me, you accursed, into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry, and you gave me no food. I was thirsty, and you gave me no drink. A stranger, and you gave me no welcome. Naked, and you gave me no clothing. Ill, and in prison, and you did not care for me. Then they will answer and say, Lord, when did we see you hungry or thirsty, or a stranger, or naked, or ill, or in prison, and not minister to your needs. He will answer them, Amen, I say to you, what you did not do for one of these least ones, you did not do for me. And these will go off to eternal punishment, but the righteous to eternal life. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. At the Savior's command and formed by divine teaching, we dare to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. May the Lord bless us, protect us from all evil, and bring us to everlasting life. Amen. Well, again, uh, welcome to everyone for our final webinar in this series. Uh, for those of you who may be joining us for the first time tonight, my name is Jonathan Sullivan. I am the Director of Catechetical Services for the Diocese of Springfield, Illinois. I'm originally from Kansas City, and my wife and I 
I have six children with another on the way in early February, so uh, we are just about to enter into that third trimester. Uh, my wife has already begun nesting. She has gotten uh, at least a good portion of the house very spick and span, so uh, we're trying to keep the rest of the kids from getting it too dirty in the meantime. Uh, I'm also a blogger at JonathanFSullivan.com. You can feel free to go there and hook up with me on Twitter or Facebook or LinkedIn or whatever social media you may prefer. A uh, couple of reminders about this series. The series is not just information delivery. Uh, there is certainly that, but uh, we also hope that this will be a little time of reflection, a little more personal in nature. Hopefully it gives you something to chew on and think about uh, in your own life, your own journey of discipleship. So uh, two times tonight there will be opportunities to respond uh, to questions that I'll throw out. So when you see this image come up, you can open and close your GoToWebinar control panel by clicking on that little orange arrow button and then entering into the box where it says enter a question for staff. You can click into there and I will see your answers to those questions and I'll be able to read those out loud to everyone. Uh, as before, we'll try just to use first names uh, when I read what people are saying uh, for privacy's sake. So uh, please do participate. Uh, as I've said the last few webinars, I've been really, really pleased with the amount of participation that folks on these webinars have done. This is still a little new, a little bit of ex an experiment trying these kinds of webinars. So uh, thank you for all of you in your participation. Uh, finally, just another overview of our series thus far. We started out in week one talking about Jesus as our image, as our model for discipleship, as the one we are called to emulate. Uh, in our particular journey. Then we talked about scripture and tradition as being the grounding of God's revelation to us, gives us the contours, the boundaries, if you will, of what it means to be a disciple of Jesus Christ. We talked about Christian community and what it means to be a disciple in community because we said there's no such thing as a solitary Christian. All Christians are called a community, and so that gives us a, a certain flavor, a certain understanding of what it means to be a disciple. Last week, we talked about liturgy and prayer, so personal prayer and communal prayer, uh, the, the great rituals, the great devotions that the church has offered to us, and we talked about how those help to energize us and prepare us to go out into the world to do the work of discipleship. And that will be our focus today is going into the world, uh, what it means to answer God's call in our lives, in our particular situations, in our particular states of lives, uh, and then participating in the mission of the church in the world, uh, regardless of what our, our particular vocation may be, uh, but looking at what that common Christian mission is that we are all called to. So with that, we are going to jump right into it tonight. Uh, the first topic I want to tackle tonight is vocation, and look uh, very broadly speaking at what we mean when we talk about vocation because it's a especially just coming off of uh, National Vocations Week last week uh, this is a, a word that you may have been hearing uh, in recent uh, days uh, but it's something that we constantly talk about in the church is, is having a vocation and everyone answering their vocation so we're going to look at what that means in the life of a disciple vocation comes from the Latin word vocare which means to call uh, and the, the basic notion here is that God is calling every single one of us to something, uh, to some work, to some uh, action, to some commitment uh, in the life of discipleship. Uh, and this is a very biblical notion, this, this notion of being called. Throughout the Old Testament and the New Testament, we see constantly a God calling people to, uh, to him, to some work, to some action. So uh, in the very beginning uh, of the Old Testament, we see Abraham and Sarah who are called out of their native land, called to the Holy Land, called to commit themselves to God, to enter into a covenant with God. In Exodus, we see Moses called by God to be sent to the Pharaoh in Egypt, to set the people free, to lead them out of Egypt and, and through the Red Sea and through the desert to the Promised Land. Uh, and the prophets, we often see the prophets being called by God, and, and oftentimes um, the, co the prophets are reluctant to answer the call because they know it's going to be difficult. They know that the people won't listen to them. I think the kind of prototypical example of that is Jonah. If you recall the, uh, the story of Jonah, Jonah is called to go and preach to the Ninevites that, that God is going to destroy the city if they don't repent, and Jonah is... Uh, so frightened by that call that he gets on a ship and, and sets sail away from Nineveh, uh, and then is uh, the ship is beset by all sorts of calamity, and, and the people finally realize it's Jonah not answering the, the call to God, and that's the point that when they throw him over and he, he winds up in the belly of the whale. Uh, I always think the interesting 
postscript to that story is Jonah then goes to the Ninevites and preaches to them, and they do repent, and God doesn't call down uh, his wrath on them because of their repentance. And, and Jonah actually winds up kind of mad about that, that, uh, that, that God kept his promise, uh, that he didn't punish the wicked Ninevites because they, they repented. Uh, so prophets often uh, are called by God, often reluctant in answering that call. Uh, in the New Testament, we see uh, Mary called by God to bear his son uh, in the story of the Annunciation and, and the angel coming to Mary and saying, uh, you have been chosen by God. God is calling you. Will you accept this call? Jesus, in turn, calls his disciples to him. Uh, and we saw in the first week that uh, in terms of the, the that kind of first century Jewish rab, rabbinic tradition, uh, that was unusual for a rabbi to call the disciples. Normally it was the disciples that would choose the rabbi. Jesus calls the disciples to him, invites them to come and uh, participate in his life and come to learn from him. The disciples then, in turn, go out to the whole world and call the world to come and know who Jesus is and come to know him. Uh, so the disciples carry on that tradition of, of calling, uh, calling the people and, and evangelizing them. So a, a very biblical notion, this idea of calling, this idea of vocation, um, not something that should be foreign to our ears, not something that should be foreign to our experience in our life of discipleship. Now, in modern usage, though, when we talk about vocation, uh, we talk about kind of three types of vocation. Uh, we use that word in, th in three very general senses. And I'm drawing from the work really here of, of Russell Shaw in his book, Catholic Laity and the Mission of the Church, where he, I think he lays out very nicely um, what we mean by vocation and the church's understanding of vocation. So th the first type of vocation that he talks about uh, is the common Christian vocation, this call to holiness, this universal call to holiness, as, as the Second Vatican Council called it. Uh, not, again, a new teaching in our church. Uh, in fact, again, it goes back to the, the very roots of Scripture, this idea that all people are called to holiness, all people are called to God. In, in essence, all people are called to be saints. That is our uh, ultimate end in God. Our ultimate journey of discipleship should lead us to become saints, enjoying the eternal kingdom with God. Uh, but since the Second Vatican Council, this has become really a renewed call because of an overemphasis on a consecrated religious life and the priesthood as avenues for holiness. Um, there became, not in official church teaching, but at least in kind of the general Catholic culture, this idea that the laity were lesser, that the laity were not able to take on that work of holiness in their life because they were so involved in the world and so involved in, in temporal affairs. Uh, so since the, the Second Vatican Council, this, this renewed call to holiness for all people. Um, and again, you know, this is not a, a new uh, teaching. In, in fact, I, I found it very interesting uh, in reading today. Today we celebrate the, the feast day of Pope Leo the Great. And in one of his sermons, he actually had uh, this to say. Although the universal church of God is constituted of distinct orders of members, Still, in spite of the many parts of its holy body, the church subsists as an integral whole, just as the Apostle says, that's the St. Paul, we are all one in Christ. Nor is anyone separated from the office of another in such a way that a lower group has no connection with the head. In the unity of faith and baptism, our community is then undivided. There is a common dignity, as the Apostle Peter says in these words, and you are built up as living stones into spiritual houses, a holy priesthood, offering spiritual sacrifices which are acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. And again, but you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people of election. So Pope Leo the Great in the 5th century was emphasizing that all people are connected to Christ as the head of the church, that even though we have specific orders of members within the church, that all of us are called to that shared dignity, that common dignity uh, of the baptized, that we are all a holy priesthood, that we all offer sacrifices acceptable to God, that we are all uh, a holy nation, a people of election. So back again to the very roots of our, our church, our, the very... Um, early understanding of what it means to be a Christian, what it means to be a baptized, all people called to holiness. So that's the common Christian vocation, this common calling. We are all called to strive for holiness, all called to, um, whatever our state in life, called to pursue that in Jesus. The second way we talk about vocation is uh, what Russell Shaw calls state in life. Uh, and here we can talk about three kind of principal states. 
Uh, and I'm going to be covering these very, very broadly. Uh, so, you know, there's a lot we could say about every single one of these. We could do an entire webinar just on, on every uh, single one of these. So we're just going to cover these very, very broadly. Uh, but that first state in life is the clergy, uh, the bishops, the priests, the deacons. Uh, I, I love uh, what the the Constitution on the Church of the Second Vatican Council says in kind of a little nice little summary paragraph where it talks about these three states in life. It says that the clergy are principally and expressly ordained to the sacred ministry. That, in a nutshell, is what the clergy are about, uh, that they are ordained for the sacred ministry, uh, which they exercise on behalf of the entire church as uh, heads of dioceses, as heads of parishes, as uh, helpers of one another in the broader ministry of Jesus Christ, uh, it's through their sacred ministry that they exercise their particular work in the church. And, and their work really is focused within the church. It's to build up the people of God, to help the people of God, to serve the people of God. Uh, but it's kind of inwardly focused. Uh, their work isn't out in the temporal affairs of the world, uh, although there may be occasions for them to, to go out into the world. Uh, but they are princi principally um, in ministry for the service of the church and, and concerned with the service to the church. The second state in life is uh, consecrated religious life. And, and the Second Vatican Council uh, says that they give outstanding and striking testimony that the world cannot be transfigured and offered to God without the spirit of the Beatitudes. I think that's a wonderful way to think about consecrated religious life, that they're called to live out the Beatitudes, to uh, serve the church through the work of the Beatitudes, and serving as, as an example for all of us uh, of what it means to live a life uh, in dedication to the Beatitudes. Um, they do that principally through what are known as the evangelical councils, which uh, we often talk about the vows of consecrated uh, religious life, poverty, chastity, obedience, that that is the way in which uh, they, they serve the church through those vows uh, and offer that example to us. Now, in general, we can talk about two different types of religious life, uh, the monastic communities, which are the communities that tend to live in cloister. Uh, they tend to be uh, dedicated to work and prayer, um, you know, gather together regularly throughout the course of the day to pray together uh, and pray for us. And that's always the thing I like to t uh, mention to people about the monastic communities is we have this popular conception of them as being locked away and not concerned with the world. Monastic life is, is very concerned with the world. They, they pray constantly for us. They may not be out in the world. We may not see them, but, but they are helping to support us and prop us up and, uh, and, bring our concerns before God through their constant prayer together in their communal life. Then the other type of consecrated religious life, uh, you know, again, we can, there's a number of different types, these being the two primary, is the mendicant orders. And the mendicant orders are the ones that do go out into the world for preaching and service. Um, they're the ones that we often see in, in our schools, in our hospitals, in uh, the various ministries of the church. Uh, the two kind of great ones being the Franciscans and the Dominicans, being the, the two really first great mendicant orders. Um, you know, going out into the world, preaching uh, and um, and teaching and, and serving the people of God through their lives. So uh, that second state in life, the consecrated religious, uh, working towards building up the kingdom through living the Beatitudes. And then finally, the, the laity, which obviously comprises the majority of the members of the church. The Second Vatican Council says of them, it belongs to the laity to seek the kingdom of God by engaging in temporal affairs and directing them according to God's will. Uh, so they're the ones who are to live in the world, who are to do the work of business, to do the work of government, to do uh, the day-to-day the -day kinds of works, the things that we see all around us, uh, but to do them through a spirit of building up the kingdom and seeking the kingdom even in those secular affairs, um, even though those, those works may not be specifically religious, it may not be quote-unquote churchy, but doing them with the spirit of Christ, doing them uh, with the love of Christ so that even in those works, the kingdom of God can be made manifest uh, and the work of the church can be done. Uh, in a sense, the laity are a bridge between the secular world and the church, um, especially in the work of the new evangelization. We often see people uh, pointing out that it's the laity who are, should really be doing the work of the new evangelization, going out and, and talking to their neighbors, talking to their family members, reinviting them to come and consider uh, the person of Jesus Christ and, and bringing Christ to them. Uh, you know, they bring Christ to the world and bring the world to Christ. They serve as that bridge, that meeting point between those two things. Now, within the laity, we can talk about two 
uh, a little more specific vocations. The first is marriage, uh, and this is where most laity would be called to uh, live out their work in laity is is in families uh, in in married life. Uh, you know, we can certainly have a whole conversation about where marriage is headed in our our communities and how uh, rampant divorce and cohabitation and other things are. are uh, weakening marriage as an institution within our culture, but w within the life of the church, that's where we would understand that most laity are called. Uh, now, some people also like to propose single life as a type of vocation within the church. Uh, this isn't really part of the church's understanding of vocation, that the single life would be a vocation, uh, in part because a vocation always involves some sort of commitment or vow. So when two people are married, they make vows to one another. When someone enters into a consecrated religious life, they take the vows of that religious community. Uh, where, uh, and those vows are always understood to be permanent. Uh, they can be dispensed with uh, by the church, but when taken, those vows are understood to be a permanent uh, a permanent promise, a permanent commitment. Single life, on the other hand, is transitional. It's not necessarily a permanent condition. Uh, if someone's going to live out the single life in a permanent way, um, this can be codified through various consecrated lives uh, in the church, not just in religious community necessarily, but through consecrated virgins and, and things like that. There are avenues for people to uh, kind of make commitments a, as a single life. So that, so understanding the single life as a vocation isn't really part of the church's teaching. It's not something you really see in the catechism or other things. On the other hand, I think there is some value to thinking about single vocation, uh, not necessarily as an official vocation in the church, but, but helping young people who are increasingly uh, delaying the age at which they're getting married, helping young people in today's world to, to think about uh, ways in which they can understand a single life in the context of the Christian life. So uh, how is God calling me as a single person to live my Christian life now, remaining open perhaps to marriage, remaining open perhaps to uh, religious life or the priesthood? Uh, but w what am I to do now? How are How is this particular situation as a single person in the world, what does that allow me to do on behalf of others? How is God calling me to be a disciple, be a Christian, as a single person, and, and what particular avenues does that, does that open up for me that maybe a married person doesn't have? For instance, just having more time because you don't have a spouse or children. Um, you know, a lot of young people in the church nowadays are taking a, a year after graduating from college and entering into various volunteer groups where they, they make a commitment for one year to go and serve in some community, whether that's in teaching, whether that's in serving in a homeless shelter or some other type of ministry like that. Uh, taking a, a whole year to, to do a volunteer year uh, is a, a wonderful gift, not something that's available if someone gets married right after college or is pursuing some other vocation. Uh, so um, I think we can help young people to think about how does a Christian live as a single person and what are, what are you being called to in that particular state that you're in right now, even if you're remaining open to those other types of vocation? I think there's ways to think about single life as a vocation, even if we don't officially recognize it as a type of vocation within the teaching of the church. So we've talked about the general uh, Christian vocation. We've talked about particular states in life. And then the third type of vocation that, that Russell Shaw talks about is the personal vocation. And he, I love this little statement uh, that he uses to define that. He says that the personal vocation is a unique combination of commitments, relationships, obligations, opportunities, strengths, and weaknesses that a particular individual who is trying to know, accept, and do God's will uses as the material of his or her life, living out the common Christian vocation and a state in life. In other words, it's about all the different factors in our life and how they have come together to call us to a particular way of living right now and to particular obligations and um, actions that we need to do because of who we are, what our strengths are, what our gifts are, what our weaknesses are, and who we have commitments to. So, for instance... Uh, as a married person, as a father, I have particular commitments that I have to make uh, for my family. So, you know, in general, being home for dinner, uh, taking care of the kids, putting them to bed, making sure that they are educated and fed and uh, having all the opportunities that, that are available to them as young people. Uh, 
I have particular commitments in my job, uh, and that's true not just for someone who works for the church, but for people who work in the secular world as well. We have commitments to do well in our job and, and do our jobs with integrity. Uh, and we have commitments to our family members, our friends. You know, it's all of these different unique combination of, of those different things that constitute our personal vocation. And that can be even geographical. Uh, you know, what am I called to do in my particular community? It can be economic. What am I called to do with uh, my wealth that has been given to me? You know, do I hoard that or do I uh, seek to share it? And if, and if I'm called to share it, as good stewards we are called to do, how particularly am I called to share it? You know, it might be that I'm particularly called to share it through um, giving gifts to education or gifts to uh, health care or to different search, uh, social service uh, organizations. You know, it's, it's all about where we're at in our lives uh, and our particular circumstances in combination with that common Christian vocation and our particular state in life. In essence, it's to ask, how am I called to holiness at this specific time and place uh, in my family, in my workplace, in my parish, <laughs> on the freeway, uh, you know, not yelling at the guy who cuts us off? You know, that, in, in a sense, is part of that personal vocation, where I'm at right now. So the first question I would like to open up for us tonight is if asked, how would you describe your personal vocation? Uh, if you had to give kind of a little you know, elevator speech on what your personal vocation is, your particular unique combination of commitments, relationships, opportunities, strengths, weaknesses, in combination with that common Christian vocation, in combination with your state and life, how would you describe that? You know, if you had to just give a little soundbite about your particular brand of discipleship. You know, that's one way we could think about it. Uh, what would that look like? Uh, again, you know, for me, part of that's being a father, part of that's being a husband, part of that's being a son and a brother. Uh, but for me also, part of that is being a diocesan catechetical leader, that in this particular time in my life, God has called me to be in this diocese and helping to uh, build up the work of evangelization and catechesis by assisting our pastors, assisting our DREs, our principals, our teachers, our catechists, uh, anyone who has an interest in the work of spreading the gospel of Jesus Christ. Uh, that's part of my particular uh, personal vocation at this particular time in my life. And uh, that certainly could change. You know, I, I don't know that I will always be in this job. I don't know that I'll always be in this particular role. Uh, not that I have any plans to go anywhere. <laughs> but, uh, you know, different seasons open up our lives, you know, God willing, at some point, uh, part of my personal vocation will be a grandfather. So, you know, throughout our lives, that, that personal vocation is evolving uh, and changing. So Maria says that part of her personal vocation is his wife, mother, catechist, and teacher. Uh, Lawson says, I thought I had an answer until now. Now as a widow, I feel like I don't know where I am. I'm not married, but I am a mother. I feel left out. Well, and, you know, that's a time of transition. And, uh, you know, that's another piece of that single life that we could talk about is, is uh, widowers and, and widows. And what does that mean? What particular gifts do you bring to the church in that uh, in that particular circumstance, you know, maybe you're going to, in your personal vocation, uh, be called to help with people who are grieving, uh, having gone through that experience yourself. I'm not saying necessarily lost, and that is what you're being called to. Uh, but that's certainly uh, an aspect of the Christian life that um, widows and widowers have access to that uh, many of the rest of us don't. So, I, yeah, I don't feel left out just because. Uh, you no longer have that state in life that you had before. Uh, you know, uh, think about and, and pray about where God is calling you at, the, at this particular time. Uh, Kayla says, wife, mother, teacher. Catherine says, spiritual support to hospital patients, moral support to family. Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, I think family for many of us is a, a big one because all of us come from some family or, or another. Um, whether big or small. So that's always a, a large commitment uh, for people. Tamara says, for me it would be being a wife, mother, and now granny. I'm also a catechist and an active member of my church through being on the budget committee, an extraordinary minister of Holy Communion, uh, a uh, lector and leader of Stephen Ministry. I'm also blessed to work at a university with many different people. Yeah, so lots of different commitments, lots of different obligations there. And, and sometimes, you know, those can be in tension with one another. We're called to being 
uh, one thing within one of those settings and, and maybe something else in another. And sometimes that can be tough as we're trying to navigate these different worlds. Nicole says, right now I feel that I am a mother and friend. I feel blessed to work with all my friends each and every day. We share our lives and faith with each other daily. We are a family. And that is a blessing, you know, when you can bring that sense of spirituality and faith and friend, friendship and family uh, into your workplace. Uh, Wonderful. Uh, Meredith says, a wife and mother, a daughter, sister, aunt, cousin, and all-around dependable family member, a teacher, coach, and co-worker, a Catholic, and trusted member of my community. Wonderful. Francis says, my calling is towards using my gifts for educating the kids in our faith at my parish. I also feel called to practice a life of prayer, charity, and humility in accord with my association with the Penitent Brothers of Our Lady of Sorrows. Finally, I am called to volunteer as a religious volunteer in Rikers Island. Wow, uh, that's you know that's a pretty unique uh, obligation there to to go into uh, a prison setting and and be a, a volunteer there. What a wonderful uh, example you must be to the to the the folks there. Liz says, I'm a wife, mother, student, and faith formation leader in my parish, assisting and supporting our catechists and families and forming children in the Catholic faith. Roxanne says, I would describe my personal vocation as a daughter, friend, teacher, mentor, and catechist. Wonderful. So a lot of similarities between everyone's answers, um, some differences as well, uh, which just goes to show that you know we, when we say personal vocation, we really do mean personal. Uh, it tends to be very unique. Robert says, college students learning to become uh, the next businessmen, theologian, teachers, mathematicians, catechists. Very good. All right, so thank you. Uh, like I said, uh, wonderful responses there, a wonderful diversity of responses. Uh, but again, we see some common themes there about family and friendship and, and, uh, and passing on the faith to others. Good. I want to talk briefly then about charisms, because charisms are very closely associated with uh, both vocation and mission. So it's kind of a nice bridge topic uh, to go between the two before we, we dive into the mission aspect of our webinar tonight. Uh, charisms is a word that's often foreign to people, but it's becoming more and more common, uh, especially as uh, we talk about new evangelization and the need for people to uh, identify their charisms. Charisms are gifts of the Holy Spirit. It's just a fancy word for talking about what are the particular gifts that you have been given by God through the Holy Spirit uh, for the work of building up the church. Now, charisms are different from natural talents. Natural talents are, are more innate to us. Uh, they're things that um, aren't necessarily supernaturally given to us, but just ar arise from who we are uh, and what we do and 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 what maybe we've practiced and what opportunities we've had in our lives. Uh, so, for instance, um, there is a charism of music, but you can also have a natural talent for music, uh, which may just be you know something you enjoy doing. It, it, it may even be something you make a living with, but it may not be a, a charism. Charisms uh, help us to exceed our own natural abilities. You know, they are a grace of God that comes into our lives to to do more on behalf of the kingdom. Now, it's, it's always important to note, though, that uh, the Holy Spirit doesn't supersede on us. It, the Holy Spirit doesn't come in and, and negate our natural talents. It doesn't negate our personality and, and our personal vocation and the way we are particularly called, uh, which is why there's such a diversity of, of saints and, and religious communities and, and people living out all these different charisms. Uh, because the Holy Spirit cooperates with us, uh, the kind of old theological language is that grace builds on nature. Grace doesn't negate nature, but grace builds on our human nature. Uh, and so we participate with that grace so that we can uh, make the charisms manifest in our lives. Uh, so they are these gifts from the Holy Spirit. Uh, they are given to us to build up the kingdom of God. Th that is their purpose, to help us to fulfill God's will in the world. Um, when talking about charisms, people often say, you know, charisms can't be used for evil. Because they are a grace, because they're given from God, they can only be used for the good. Now, we may not always cooperate with them, and so they may not always be effective, uh, but they cannot be used for bad. Uh, they can only be used for good. They can only be used for that purpose that God has given them to us. And there's many different types of charisms. In fact, um, you know, there's the, the old uh, list of the gifts of the Holy Spirit from Scripture and, and such, but Charisms, uh, more broadly understood, uh, are almost infinite in the way that they can be made manifest. Um, 
and the, the Catherine of Siena Institute, uh, which has done a lot of work on charism and charism discernment. In fact, they have an entire workshop called Called and Gifted, in which they help people to learn about and identify their particular charisms. Uh, they've identified at least, I think the list is around 40 different charisms, uh, and they've kind of categorized them. And the categor Categorize, categorization that they offer is uh, there are pastoral charisms, uh, charisms that help people to um, you know, shepherd one another. There are communication charisms that help people to uh, relate the word of God and pass on the word of God. Organizational charisms, uh, so how we administer and organize and, and do work. Uh, lifestyle charisms, things like poverty, uh, you know, how we live our lives. Uh, chastity would be another of the lifestyle ones, and then charisms of healing, uh, whether that's in helping people to reconcile with one another, whether that's actual physical healing, you know, kind of a rare charism, but uh, one we've certainly seen in, in saints and in, in different uh, miraculous stories in the church. Uh, but they, the, the Catherine of Siena Institute goes on to say that, you know, that's just a, a list of kind of the more common ones, but charisms can really take all sorts of different um, forms in the, in the life of a Christian. But in order to identify our charisms, and this even goes back to vocation when we talk about vocation, uh, what we're really talking about is a process of discernment, a process of trying to identify uh, what gifts we've been given, what God is calling us to do at a particular time, how we're to use those charisms. Discernment is really the key to unlocking vocation, to unlocking our, our charisms. And you know, it would be useful if there was just kind of a, a set questionnaire we could do when, when discerning what what God is calling us to or what our charisms are. Uh, unfortunately, it's not that easy. <laughs> uh, discerning, uh, discerning our place in the church, discerning uh, what we're called to do is always a much tougher and time-intensive activity uh, because God normally doesn't just strike us with lightning and say, thou shalt. Uh, rather, it's a more of an unfolding in our lives. It's a, a constant uncovering of what God is calling us to. But there are clues in our lives when we're doing that process of discernment, uh, whether that's of charism, vocation, uh, or other, uh, some clues that, that will point us in the right direction. One is just where, where our heart is pulling us. Uh, our natural uh, desires and our, our uh, personal inclinations, uh, sometimes we, we can discount those because we think, well, that's just what I want, but is it really what God's calling us to? Uh, you know, God uses our, our natural interests, our natural uh, drawing towards something to, to clue us in that maybe this is something we should explore. Maybe this, maybe this has something to it. So being aware of the stirring of our hearts, being aware when uh, we're perking up around a particular topic or activity, uh, that can help us to clue in what God is calling us to do. Uh, the affirmation of others is another way in which God can help us to identify what uh, we're being called to do. Uh, when others can identify, hey, you know, have you ever noticed you're really good at this? You know, that can help us to identify a charism. That can identify something we might be called to do. Uh, you know, for catechists and teachers, you know, this is one way in which we can really encourage vocations uh, in our classrooms is by uh, identifying, you know, kids we think may have a vocation to religious life or to the priesthood and, and say to them, you know, have you ever considered, you know, I see this particular ability in you, I see this particular gift within you, have you ever considered that you might be called to? Uh, you know, when you hear vocation stories, it's, it's often a family member or a friend or a catechist or, or someone who has planted that seed and just helped someone to be open, you know, and, and not saying that, you know, you must do this, but would you be open to this? Is this something you'd be willing to explore? You know, just those sorts of simple prompts can help to open people's hearts. And, and maybe they're not. Maybe they're, they're uh, being called to something else. Uh, I had an experience in college where someone said, uh, um, you know, I always thought you'd make a good priest, and, and this was right after I got engaged to my wife, and uh, I think they were wrong. I think I probably would have made a pretty lousy priest. Uh, but, uh, you know, so it's not always that just because we're being affirmed in something that we're being called to it. Uh, but, you know, again, it's a clue. It's, it's another little piece of the puzzle. Observable results, that can be something. You know, if, if we're trying out a charism or trying something, uh, trying a particular uh, lifestyle out, uh, is it generating results? Does it work? Uh, you know, if we're seeing it, trying to see if we have a charism of intercessory prayer. When we pray for people, do things happen, things that you wouldn't normally expect to happen that you couldn't necessarily explain outside of prayer? Well, uh, those kind of observable results, sometimes they can clue us in a little bit.
And then finally, is it congruent with church teaching? You know, are are we being called to something that uh, that isn't against church teaching? You, know, you you wouldn't say that someone has a calling to be an axe murderer. Uh, that obviously would not be something we would encourage or or consider consistent with church teaching. Uh, so you know, that's another clue on whether or not this is right or not. You know, is it does it fall within uh, what we understand vocation, what we understand charism to be. Uh, in terms of the, the totality of the church's teaching. So uh, those are kind of four clues. There's many, many others that we could talk about, but I think those are four really good ones when we're trying to figure out, you know, is this part of God's will for me uh, that we can use to clue in and help that process of discernment. So then for the second part of our webinar tonight, I want to talk about mission and talk about, uh, in particular, what it means to participate in the mission of the church and what it means to go into the world and, and do the work that Christ has called us to do. When we talk about mission of the church, I, I think, first of all, we have to recognize that the primary mission of the church is evangelization. And I, I'm kind of going to just walk through this really based on uh, some quotes that I've pulled from uh, Evangelii Nuntiandi, which is Pope Paul VI document on evangelization. Uh, I think he really has given us a wonderful basis for understanding what evangelization means in the life of the church, what it means in the life of the Christian believer. And he says in that document, um, which uh, he wrote after a synod on evangelization, this was uh, his apostolic exhortation following a synod, uh, talking about evangelization. Uh, and so quoting the synod fathers, he says, we wish to confirm once more that the task of evangelizing all people constitutes the essential mission of the church. He goes on to say, it is a task and mission which the vast and profound changes of present day society make all the more urgent. Evangelizing is, in fact, the grace and vocation proper to the church, her deepest identity. She exists in order to evangelize, that is to say, in order to preach and teach, to be the channel of the gift of grace, to reconcile sinners with God, and to perpetuate Christ's sacrifice in the Mass, which is the memorial of his death and glorious resurrection. You know, I love, I mean, I don't think you can put it any more starkly than that. The church exists in order to evangelize. That is why Christ gave us the church, was to go out into the world and, and proclaim his message. But that always, again, takes place in the context of community. And we talked about that a couple of weeks ago when we talked about Christian community, that, that this always occurs within uh, our relationships with others. Uh, and that's because evangelization requires a reaching beyond ourselves. Uh, requires a reaching beyond the confines of the Christian church. Evangelization always has to reach out to others, uh, and so it always has that context of relationship. Again, quoting from uh, Paul VI, the Christian community is never closed in upon itself. The intimate life of this community, the life of listening to the word and the apostles' teaching, charity lived in a fraternal way, the sharing of bread, this intimate life only acquires its full meaning when it becomes a witness, when it evokes admiration and conversion, and when it becomes the preaching and proclamation of the good news. Thus it is the whole church that receives the mission to evangelize, and the work of each individual member is important for the whole. So he's also pointing us here to the fact that evangelization requires both witness and proclamation. Uh, it's always a both and. It's never an either or. Uh, again, quoting from the document, even the finest witness will prove ineffective in the long run if it is not explained and justified. What Peter called always having your answer ready for people who ask you the reason for the hope that you all have and made explicit by a clear and unequivocal proclamation of the Lord Jesus. The good news proclaimed by the witness of life sooner or later has to be proclaimed by the word of life. There is no true evangelization if the name, the teaching, the life, the promises, the kingdom, and the mystery of Jesus of Nazareth, the Son of God, are not proclaimed. So we always have to, to keep these in balance, witness and proclamation. Uh, I think I said in a previous uh, webinar. You know, there's that quote that's often attributed to Francis of Assisi, preach the gospel always, if necessary, use words. 
you know, that's a, that's a good quote as far as it goes, but I think in our modern context we sometimes use it as an excuse not to use words. We say that, well, my witness is enough. I'm a good person in the world. People see that. That's my evangelization. I think Paul VI in this uh, exhortation really challenges that notion that witness on its own can, can stand as evangelization. Uh, as he says, there is no true evangelization if we are not proclaiming the gospel of Jesus Christ. Because if we don't, then our good works in the world, our witness in the world, just becomes nice things that we do. But there's no connection to the why. There's no connection to the faith that precipitates those things. So let's talk just a minute about those two poles, the witness and the proclamation and what they mean. The witness is how we live in the world. It's uh, our fundamental attitude. It's our fundamental stance that we take as Christians in the world. And I think if we had to pick a primary attitude that, that Christians need to take into the world, it needs to be joy. Uh, our, our witness, our, our life in the world needs to be characterized by joy because as recent popes, as uh, Recent documents on new evangelization have, have pointed out again and again, it is joy, it is the Christian joy that we live that will attract people to us and, and get them to ask, you know, what is it about this person? What is it about their life uh, that makes them the way that they are? What is it about uh, their faith that prompts such a warmth and generosity and hospitality and, and joy? Uh, Tertullian uh, writing in the very early, early years of the church, says that when he would go into the world, he would see the pagans who were just astonished at the way the early Christians lived. And they would say, see how they love one another. See how these Christians live. They live an attitude of love, uh, even though they come from very, very different uh, socioeconomic places, even though some are, some are very, very rich and some are slaves and uh, some are Jews and some are Greeks and some are Romans. Uh, they love one another in spite of all those differences. Uh, they, are, they have a, a common community, a, a common joy, a common faith that they, they share and, and, and live freely among each other. Uh, so that joy, having that as the primary attitude when we go into the world uh, and bringing that joy to others, uh, that should be the, the primary stance that Christians take into the world. And that's not to say that we won't experience sorrow. It's not to say that we won't experience hardship. Uh, but, you know, behind that all should be a, a persistent and, and far-reaching uh, love and, and outreach and, and joy that we bring wherever we go. But again, that witness always has to be accompanied by proclamation. It always has to be accompanied uh, by the reason that we give for our actions, by pointing out that, uh, you know, we do these things because we are called by our Savior to do so. Uh, as we heard in the gospel that was proclaimed at the beginning of the webinar, uh, Jesus says we are to go and to do these great works in the world. We are called to reach out to others and extend to them the mercy of God. Uh, that is why we do these things, because God has commanded us to do them, uh, because we are his disciples and seek to follow him, uh, to, it, to uh, explicitly mimic Jesus in the way he lived his life uh, and bringing the healing and, and, and the grace of God into the world. You know, we must make explicit the reason for our joy. We have to make explicit the reason we do these things in the world. And that always means, again, as, as Pope Paul said, focusing first and foremost on that kerygma, uh, on that core message uh, of the gospel, that, that God came into the world, that, that Jesus Christ became man, uh, suffered and died on our behalf, and was raised uh, to heaven. Uh, to lead the way for us to enjoy eternal life with God. Uh, that should always, at some point, enter into that conversation. And that's not to say, again, that we stand on a street corner with a bullhorn and, and shout these things to all passerbys. You know, it, we have to have that relationship. That's why the church uh, insists on the importance of witness. You know, we have to draw people to us first. We don't go and browbeat them uh, with these things. But we seek to, to be... Um, to be attractive, to, to have a winsome uh, message for them that, that attracts them. Uh, that's why Father Barron, again and again, talks about the importance of beauty in evangelization, uh, that beauty will attract people, that beauty will draw people to us, uh, whether that's the beauty of a, a beautiful church building or the beauty in which we live our lives. Um, you know, we need to use those things to draw people to us and then enter into conversation when they ask, you know, why are you doing this? Uh, why are you... Uh, serving the homeless? Why are you uh, facilitating adoptions? Why do you do these things? Well, 
uh, because we believe that we are called by God to do them, uh, that we are called to live this way in the world on his behalf because we want to be his disciples. Uh, that always has to be part of that conversation uh, in a gentle way, not in a, a browbeating way, but in a gentle way and little pieces at a time. You know, you don't need to sit down and, and pour the catechism on someone in, in one sitting. Uh, you, know, you can just uh, add little pieces every time you have opportunities to talk with them. Because if you have that relationship, if you're living in a winsome way uh, and, and using beauty to attract people, you know, they'll come back again and again, and you'll be able to have those opportunities for ongoing conversation instead of just a, a one-and-done kind of thing. And so finally, to end uh, with our final section for tonight, I just want to do a focus uh, on the works of mercy, because I think when we talk about witness, when we talk about the way that we live in the world, I think, I don't know if we could have a better starting place than the works of mercy. Uh, they are, you know, the traditional acts of charity and penance uh, that Christians are called to do in the world, uh, and, and very... Uh, you know, they're not terribly elaborate. They're not terribly complicated. Uh, they're pretty simple when you really get right down to them. Uh, of course, the works of mercy come in two categories, the corporal, uh, those works we do in the world to help people with their physical needs, and the spiritual, the, the works that we do in the world to meet the, the spiritual longings and the spiritual needs of people in our culture. Now, it's interesting, the, the corporal works of mercy are taken straight out of sacred scripture. Uh, again, the, the first six you see on the list on the screen here, uh, straight out of the Gospel of Matthew that we heard at the beginning of the webinar. Uh, to feed the hungry, give drink to the thirsty, clothe the naked, shelter the homeless, visit the sick, and visit the imprisoned. Uh, all taken directly out of uh, that chapter from Matthew's Gospel. Uh, the last one on there, to bury the dead, that actually comes out of the book of Tobit. Uh, you know, and I always think that's an interesting one because it's it's something that we have in common with uh, many uh, certainly ancient cultures. You know, that importance of burying the dead and not allowing the dead just to to lie out in the open uh, to be uh, ravaged by by natural forces, but the importance of of reverencing uh, the body of the dead. I always think that's a that's an interesting point of reference that we have with many different cultures from around the world. Uh, the spiritual, you know, I, I, I tried to do a little bit of research to see if I could come up with where exactly the spiritual works of mercy come from. I, I didn't find anything. Uh, if you know, maybe pop it in the question box real quick, because I'd be curious to know where exactly those spiritual works of mercy come from. Uh, but they are to instruct the ignorant, to counsel the doubtful, to admonish sinners, to bear wrongs patiently, to forgive offenses willingly, to comfort the afflicted, and to pray for the living and the dead. Now, it, it's interesting because the spiritual works of mercy, uh, a couple of resources that I, I was looking at, pointed out that uh, a few of these actually require some special gifts or, or authority that uh, we're not all, and this goes actually for all of them, that we're not called to do every single one of these works. Uh, again, in our personal vocation, we may find ourselves called to uh, particular works that we're particularly called to. I, I would guess, just given uh, the nature of the audience on this webinar, that there's a number of people here who are particularly drawn to instructing the ignorant because of the work of catechesis uh, and uh, the work of Catholic education, uh, that we see that as uh, a work that we may feel particularly drawn to uh, in that work, to, to uh, instruct, to catechize, to educate. Uh, you know, that, you know, I don't know if that's something you've ever made a connection with before, but um, you are doing a work of mercy in that work, uh, in being a catechist and being a teacher. Uh, but not everyone's necessarily going to be called to that. Not everyone has the, the knowledge or the gifts to be a good teacher, just as not everyone uh, has the gifts to be a good uh, admonisher of sinners. Uh, in fact, I would, I would bargain just by what I see online that a, a lot of people may think they have that particular calling to, to exercise that work of mercy, but uh, don't do so in a particularly Christian fashion. Uh, but there's certainly some that we're all called to do, to bear wrongs patiently, to forgive offenses willingly, to pray for the living and the dead. We're all called to those sorts of works uh, in our day-to-day -day lives. To, to, that's just part of how we, we live our, our Christian vocation in the world, that common Christian vocation. Now, a lot of these, though, again, are, are done in the world, especially those corporal works of mercy, you know, going out into the world, meeting people's spiritual needs. And again, going back to our, our understanding of those states of life, it, it's often for the laity uh, to uh, 
discern and decide uh, how these works are being carried out in the world. It's, it's the purview of the lady to do those things through uh, the work of business, through the work of government, through the work of different social agencies that are in work in the world. Uh, you know, we take direction from uh, uh, the church's teaching and from our, our pastors and such, uh, but you know, it's really often for the lady to decide how that is best done. Uh, that is their particular calling in the world to do that. Uh, now, it's not to say that, again, uh, others don't participate in that as well, and certainly uh, these works of mercy are part of the church's work in the public square. Uh, we see organizations like Catholic Relief Services, Catholic Charities USA, uh, here in our diocese, our annual Campaign for Justice and Hope, uh, which collects money and distributes grants uh, for different agencies doing these types of works of mercy. Uh, I had the opportunity uh, some months back to sit on the luncheon where those grants were awarded, and it was really... Uh, gratifying and inspiring to see not just the work that, that folks are doing in our diocese uh, with the, the, the grants from the campaign, but the diversity of work being done. It's not just uh, homeless shelters. It's not just food kitchens, but uh, you know, working with the deaf and, and working with other disadvantaged groups and, and work on behalf of racial reconciliation, which uh, if you know anything, know anything about the history of, of our particular uh, part of the state, you know, uh, we have a, a long history of racial unrest, and including a, a race riot uh, here in Springfield, which helped to precipitate the creation of the NAACP. Uh, so lots of people doing different types of, of works of mercy uh, in our diocese and around the world, um, doing that work. And yet I sometimes wonder if, if our culture isn't increasingly hostile to the works of mercy. Uh, one example you may have, have heard about, which has been in the news lately, uh, is this proliferation of uh, laws against assisting the homeless in different cities around the country. And uh, Arnold Abbott has been making the news down in Florida and Fort Lauderdale, uh, was cited for feeding uh, a homeless person in his community, which is against the law in his community. And he is standing up to the mayor of his town and, and continuing to do that work of feeding the hungry in his community. Uh, but, you know, I think I see a, a real shift in our culture uh, against these kinds of works of mercy and, and seeing them as uh, perpetuating nuisances, perpetuating uh, undesirable people in the community. Uh, there was pictures going around on Twitter uh, some months back uh, of England, but also I think some from America, of buildings putting spikes around their entrances, uh, putting really painful spikes around their entrances uh, so that homeless people wouldn't sit there or, or wouldn't lay down there. Um, and there's actually companies now selling these types of devices uh, that you can put in under underpasses and around buildings that will discourage people from uh, using them to shelter themselves. Uh, you know, I wonder what that says about us as a culture, that we are willing to put up those kinds of devices that uh, prevent people from taking care of their, their basic needs, people who don't have uh, homes, who don't have food. Uh, you know, what's that say about us as a culture? You know, but not just feeding the the hungry. I think there's lots of different ways in which our culture is is uh, is turning against these kinds of works of mercy, uh, comforting the afflicted. One of the spiritual works of mercy uh, in a culture that is increasingly um, accepting of assisted suicide. Uh, you know, that is kind of a quick fix instead of allowing people to do the work of, of comforting the afflicted and, and walking with them in their suffering and, and helping them to work through their suffering and understand it and, and maybe even start to use it for the good and, and using it in terms of redemptive suffering. Uh, you know, if we just have a quick fix of, of assisted suicide, you know, what is then, how do we comfort then the afflicted if, if the afflicted just have a, a, an easy out? Uh, I think those are questions worth asking. I think they're questions worth asking uh, in the public square and, and asking them, uh, you know, is, is this the kind of culture that we want to build? Is, is this the kind of uh, communities we, we want to live in where just the simple act of feeding someone who's hungry uh, is punishable by fines and, and even by jail? So, uh, you know, not that I have any of the answers, but uh, questions I think are useful for us to ask. So uh, our final kind of questions for the evening then, uh, what aspect of the church's mission speaks to you? Uh, and how have you participated in, in evangelization or in the works of mercy? Uh, you know, what does that look like in your life? What have you tried out? What seems to work for you?
Uh, first, though, a question from Christine. Is there a difference between actually feeding the poor, like Pope Francis does, helping out at a soup kitchen, or donating money to a charity who feeds the hungry? Uh, is any of these preferred over the other? Um, yeah, I think those are both different ways in which we feed the hungry. You know, there, it isn't just about one particular way in which we do these things. Yes, I think donating money to a soup kitchen or to a food pantry, uh, that is a, another way in which we uh, can feed the hungry through the use of our resources, through the, the use of our uh, monetary uh, resources that have been given to us. So I, I don't, if one's preferred over the other, I I think... Again, part of that's going to depend on your personal vocation, what you're personally being called to do. I think there is uh, something to be said for interacting with the poor, for interacting with the hungry, uh, being a personal presence to them. Again, that may not be something that everyone is called to. Uh, maybe you're called to support the people who do that through your donations. Uh, so I, I don't necessarily want to say that one's preferred over the other for everyone. Uh, I think there is something to be said for, for being that personal presence and having that personal interaction with the poor, in part because that's what Jesus did, uh, and in part because, again, it allows us to establish those relationships and is, I think, very, very good uh, on the other end for the poor to be able to uh, give them a, a comforting word, to be able to, to show that we don't shun them, that we don't turn away from them just because they're poor, just because they're uh, homeless, uh, but that we respect their dignity as human persons. Uh, so again, that, that may be opportunities you have, it may be opportunities you don't have, uh, but that, that, that would be kind of my reflection on that. Margaret says, uh, the benches by the Abraham Lincoln Museum here in Springfield have dividers in the benches so the street people can't sleep on them. You know, I've never noticed that before. Uh, I'm going to, I'm going to look at that next time I'm downtown. Uh, that's, you know, that's, that's quite frankly really sad to hear that uh, you know, we have those kinds of uh, infrastructure in place to discourage that. Uh, that's too bad. Francis says, I have to say that the Lord asks us to give of our time more than with our pocketbook. Uh, I, I, you know, I think that's absolutely true. I think uh, in many ways it's our, our energy and our time that the Lord desires uh, more than just yeah, what's in our wallets because it, it engages more of the whole person. Uh, yeah, because, you know, that personal connection that we can make, uh, which is not to disparage the people who have the resources to give and to give generously. Uh, you know, many of these services couldn't do the work they're doing without the great generosity of people. But, yeah, I think too often uh, we sometimes use our pocketbooks as a way to get out of that deeper work. Yeah. Uh, Maria says, I actually work for a school run by the Sisters of Mercy. I take students to a soup kitchen on our days off. That's wonderful. That is wonderful. Uh, Nicole says, I feel that it is easier to do the corporal works of mercy because they are visual and hands-on. The spiritual works are harder for me, unfortunately. Uh, yeah, and, and maybe that's just because of the particular charisms, the particular gifts, the particular vocation you have. Uh, but, uh, yeah, some people are going to find others very, very easier than others. Uh, Catherine says, visit the imprisoned, visit the sick, write to the imprisoned, direct the poor to the help, to the help that they need. Very good. Lana says, by visiting the elderly in the nursing homes, taking them Eucharist, also by voting for the rights of the elderly, especially in nursing homes. That's a wonderful one because, uh, you know, that's a, another one we could talk about is uh, a society that is increasingly pushing the elderly into, uh, you know, outside of the public spaces so that we don't have to, to see them and interact with them. Uh, but, boy, you know, what, what wonderful people they are. I uh, had the opportunity to take my oldest son uh, a year ago to uh, a, a parish was doing a, a visit to their local uh, nursing home. And, and what a wonderful opportunity just to hear. And especially, I think, for my, my son, uh, just to be able to talk with someone who uh, is older, uh, probably would about the age of his great-grandparents, only one of which of his is, is living. Uh, we don't get to see her very often. So the opportunity to, to hear those stories and to hear their experiences uh, about what it was like when they grew up, I think it was really, really fascinating for him. And again, you know, wonderful to establish those relationships and to be able to, to listen and hear their stories, because I think uh, just the, the act of listening is important for the elderly so that they can share their stories. Lawson says, having come from an evangelical Protestant formation, learning to proclaim the good news comes more naturally than it does in my Catholic family. I want more of my sisters and brothers to speak naturally of their experiences with, experience with Christ. That is their witness. You don't have to proclaim the catechism, which is wonderful. 
Yes, absolutely. Uh, in our diocese, we've been talking more and more about just being able to share our stories of faith. Uh, you know, how has how has God, how has Jesus worked in our lives uh, for the good? And so we actually have started doing. Uh, little workshops just to help people to develop their faith stories and to be able to practice telling them. So we actually have people sit down, we kind of have a little worksheet that they we walk them through, uh, you know, helping to prompt some stories of faith, and then we ask them to choose one and actually develop that into a little narrative. And then they actually sit down and share that with someone because what we often find is that you know, we're not going to be invited to share our stories most of the time. It's going to be, here's a particular instance where we're sitting down talking with someone and an opportunity arises to share a story. And so if we've thought of them beforehand, um, if we've even practiced sharing them, it makes it a little more natural for us to be able to say, you know, that reminds me of this time that God did such and such in my life. Uh, so, yeah, being able to find those ways to do that. Um, and, and helping people to practice sharing their stories, to sharing their witness, uh, is is really important for the work of the new evangelization. Maria says, I feel like my teaching methods incorporate the spiritual works of mercy, and my service outside of school reflects the corporal works. Uh, Robert says, being involved in community service, such as serving in a soup kitchen, or even raising awareness for different causes, such as hunger and homelessness. Very good. Uh, Francis says, when we see Christ in the face of the people we serve, in the soup kitchens, in the prisons, in the hospitals, we receive his joy of being a disciple. Absolutely. Which is, again, going back to uh, the gospel reading. You know, it's being able to see Christ in those people and that we are serving Christ when we serve the least of these. Meredith says, I help physically and mentally challenge children and adults through Special Olympics and family festivals. I also donate clothes and time to the less privileged and share that importance with my children. Wonderful. And that, you know, and that's, that's really important, I think, especially for these younger generations, uh, especially for the millennials. Uh, you know, every generation has its good and its bad points. Uh, but one of the th gifts I think that the millennials really have is a real spirit of service, a real spirit of volunteerism. Uh, I've seen different explanations for that, why that is. I think part of it is uh, many millennials went from college into a workplace where there just weren't many opportunities. And so they found opportunities to be able to get involved in volunteer things and, and wanting to be able to do something with their time, even if it wasn't uh, – in an, a, a job that they felt particularly called to, but, but finding opportunities to volunteer and, and uh, use their talents in a way that was, was building up their communities. Uh, so absolutely sharing that with, with children, helping them to recognize the importance of, of these works, but then helping them to reflect on it in a theological way. Uh, America Magazine had a really great article a couple of uh, a month or two ago, about the importance of service opportunities in Catholic education, but even more than the service, you know, the theological reflection on the service, helping kids to make the connection between what they're doing for people uh, and their faith in Jesus Christ, so that it's not just about, you know, we painted this wall, but it's about we made manifest the kingdom, we, we did something on behalf of others. Vicky says, I find it very rewarding to go on teen mission trips each year to help those in need. It is great to be helping others and very touching to see teenagers helping others. Absolutely. Yeah, just what we were talking about. Uh, Lawson says, uh, what you just described is a perfect way to tell your story. Uh, going back, yeah, to sharing the witness. Uh, I think it is easier to go feed people than it is to tell them about your story with Jesus and how you know him, why you come to feed people. The things are easier than the why, but the whys are where the truth is told. Absolutely. Uh, which, again, is why it's important to be practicing that. Uh, you know, I, it, it may feel silly. It, it may feel weird uh, for us, especially, I think, sometimes us as Catholics. Uh, you know, we're not used to talking about faith in that way. But when we practice them, it makes it easier. You know, we, when we thought about it beforehand, it, it makes it easier to share when those opportunities arise. Well, that's actually the end of uh, the webinar for this evening, uh, ending a little bit early tonight, which is fine. We do have some time for Q&A, uh, and then uh, we'll have a closing prayer after that. So if you have any other questions or comments, uh, now is your time to share that, whether about tonight's webinar or about connections you've made with uh, any of the previous webinars, um, you know, uh, take an opportunity now to allow people to do that. Uh, I just want to say uh, how rewarding these, these past few weeks have been for me. Uh, it's been exhausting uh, preparing for a weekly webinar uh, for the past couple of weeks, uh, but I have really enjoyed this. This was a bit of an experiment uh, to try 
uh, kind of a webinar-based catechist formation session. Uh, I didn't know if people were uh, going to be interested or were going to be willing to participate and, and typing their answers in. So I've been extraordinarily gratified at your participation, at your uh, at your constancy in being here, uh, I have actually been really pleased to see names cropping up week after week, and our numbers have been fairly consistent in terms of who's been attending. So uh, thank you so much for being here and for helping me with this. Uh, we are going to be trying some different types of video catechesis uh, after the first of the year, so uh, I invite you to stay tuned for those. Uh, a couple of messages of thanks uh, cropping up here. Thank you all. Uh, I really do appreciate that. Uh, I'll also mention uh, at the end of this webinar, there will be uh, one last survey. If you take just a couple of minutes and fill that out, I appreciate it. It helps us just get a little bit of feedback. Uh, and especially one of the questions, this is actually something I probably should have asked in the registrations, uh, but we just want a sense of how many people from our diocese are participating. Uh, that will just give us a, an idea of uh, how effective these have been in terms of our internal catechist formation process. So. Uh, I appreciate that. Uh, Francis is asking, uh, loved your definition of, I think that's charism, uh, repeat it in one sentence. Uh, I think that's what you're asking. Uh, charism really is just the gifts of the Holy Spirit that, that have been given to us uh, for building up the kingdom of God in the world. Uh, again, they, they can only be used for good. They can't be used for evil. They're more than just our natural talents, but they build on our natural talents and allow us to do things that we just wouldn't be able to do without the grace of God. All right, well, again, thank you all so much for your participation in this series. Uh, a video of this will be up, as well as the slides, uh, probably sometime tomorrow at the website for the... Uh, uh, for the webinar series, and, and we'll be keeping all that up. In fact, we'll, we'll even be transferring a lot of that, I think, to our diocesan website so that folks in the future, uh, if they need this particular catechist formation course for their process, they'll be able to watch the videos, uh, fill out the handouts, and be able to get that catechist formation credit. So uh, this will be an ongoing resource available to folks uh, in our diocese, certainly, but if you're from another diocese and want to share this, please feel free to share that link with folks uh, if you think that they would find it helpful. So finally then, just our closing prayer for our webinar tonight and for uh, our entire series. And, and to close it out, I'm going to use uh, a prayer for the new evangelization uh, from the United States Conference for Catholic Bishops in their resource called Disciples Called to Witness. Gracious and merciful God, we pray that through the Holy Spirit all Catholics may hear the call of the new evangelization and seek a deeper relationship with your Son, Jesus. We pray that the new evangelization will renew the Church, inspiring all Catholics to go forth and make disciples of all nations and transform society through the power of the Gospel. We pray for all members of the Church that we heed the words of Christ, do not be afraid and strengthened by the Holy Spirit's gift of courage, give witness to the gospel and share our faith with others. We pray that we may become like the father of the prodigal son, filled with compassion for our missing brothers and sisters, and run to embrace them upon their return. We pray that all people yearning to know Christ and the Church may encounter him through the faithful who witness to his love in their lives. Loving God, our Father, Strengthen us to become witnesses to the saving grace of your Son, Jesus our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you again, everyone, and God bless you in your particular vocation, in your particular uh, state of life. Um, May the Holy Spirit's gifts be poured out abundantly upon you for the work you do in the church. Thank you. God bless.